Greetings, friends. Learning is a hobby here. Uh, I wanted to go over my summary for Spivax uh, Appendix to Chapter 8, which is what I'm going to do in this video. So let me bring up the notes. This is going to be kind of a short video because the appendix is very short, but we'll go through it. Okay, so uh, I've mentioned this before, but the, this appendix is on the, the concept of uniform continuity. So let's start with the definition. What do we mean by a function being uniformly continuous on an interval? So the function f is uniformly continuous on an interval a if for every epsilon greater than zero, there's some delta greater than zero such that for all x and y in a, if absolute value x minus y less than delta, then absolute value f of x minus f of y less than epsilon. So this, uh, this concept of um, uniformly continuous uh, on an interval is different than continuous at a point. Um, first of all, it's it's a uh, a property of a function on an interval, not at just a, a unique point. But um, also, what this is saying is that the uh, delta that we pick, in, in if we're just talking about you know continuity at a point, the delta that we pick may uh, depend not only on the epsilon value that we choose, but also the value of a that we choose. Uh, here, this is uh, more strict. So this is saying that um, over an, uh, an interval, if the function is uniformly continuous, then there should be, uh, for any epsilon greater than zero, there should be some delta that it just depends on epsilon. Not, it shouldn't depend on, um, you know, the, the points, provided that the, you know, the two points that you're looking at are uh, satisfied, the, you know, this property here. So it's, this is a, um, much more strict kind of continuity than just point continuity. All right. Um, here's an example that he gives in the this uh, in the appendix uh, to illustrate um, a function that's not uniformly continuous. So we know that f of x is x equals x squared is continuous for each a in R. That's point continuity. However, it is not uniformly continuous on R because for a given epsilon greater than zero, the delta greater than zero we choose so that absolute value x minus a less than delta implies absolute value f of x minus f of a less than epsilon depends on epsilon and on a. So remember for uniform continuity, the delta just depends on epsilon, not on the point a. Uh, for for example, if you choose a plus delta over two in the interval from a minus delta to a plus delta uh, and plug that into the you know f of um, f of that value minus f of a and simplify, you get absolute value of a delta plus delta squared over four. And that's clearly greater than or equal to a delta. So if a is greater than epsilon over delta, then the difference of f of a plus delta over two minus f of a in absolute value will be greater than or equal to epsilon rather than less than epsilon. So the, the delta here depends not only on epsilon, but it also depends on what value of a we pick. All right, so this is uh, the squaring functions not uniformly continuous on R. Uh, it is uniformly continuous on a um, closed bounded interval of R though, and we'll see that in a minute. Um, so here, just continuing with uh, the, what he says in the, in the example. However, on a, any closed bounded interval a, b, y equals x squared is uniformly continuous. In fact, for any interval um, negative n to n, this is the closed interval, uh, the delta that works at n or negative n will work for each x in the interval because y equals x squared is Oh, sorry, y equals x squared grows slash decays faster and faster as the absolute value of x increases, All right? You know, the, the parabola, right? If you, on the interval from zero to infinity, the rate of change gets large, gets bigger and bigger um, as x gets bigger and bigger, right? The rate of change is 2x. We haven't talked about derivatives yet, but, and same thing if you go in the negative direction. So, y equals x squared is not uniformly continuous um, on R, but it is con uh, uniformly continuous on a closed bounded interval. Uh, he gives another example here before we get to the two sort of uh, propositions, uh, main propositions in uh, this appendix. He gives the example of f of x equals sine one over x. Uh, this is also an example of a function that is not uniformly continuous. For any epsilon greater than, uh, sorry, for any epsilon less than one, there will, 
excuse me, there will not be one delta greater than zero. That works for the function at all points A in the open interval from zero to one, uh, because, you know, think about the that crazy behavior that sine one over X exhibits near the origin, uh, you know, it oscillates quicker and quicker as you get closer and closer to the origin. So in order to get within uh, a spe specified uh, epsilon bound, uh, as you approach zero, the deltas have to get tinier, tinier and tinier. Um, and there's no, you know, at, at zero, the, the sign of one over X isn't even continuous there because it's not defined at zero. So you can't even sort of, uh, uh, it's hard to sort of get around um, how to talk about this exactly because we don't have the language yet to do it. But that point at zero, the, there's no way of sort of getting a bound uh, it has to do with with something called compactness. Uh, the, this is not this function is not um, continuous on a on a compact interval. But anyway, um, that that's a function that that doesn't have the uniform continuity property. Um, so here's a note, just like with the concept of a continuous function being bounded on a closed bounded interval, we may suspect that a continuous function will be uniformly continuous on a closed bounded interval. There's one technicality we need to check, which is the lemma that he actually makes us go over here. Um, here's, I'll just read out the lemma and then we'll do the proof. Uh, we're going to use this lemma for the theorem, the one big theorem in, in this uh, appendix, which we'll do after the lemma. So let a less than B less than C, and let F be continuous on the interval, uh, the closed interval from A to C. Let epsilon greater than zero, and suppose that statements, uh, so there's two statements here, if X and Y are in the closed interval from A to B, an absolute value X minus Y less than delta, uh, sorry, less than delta one, then absolute value F of X minus F of Y less than epsilon, and uh, statement two, if X and Y are in the closed, interval from B to C, and absolute value X minus Y less than delta two, then absolute value F of X minus F of Y less than epsilon hold, then there is a delta greater than zero such that if X and Y are in the closed interval from A to C, and absolute value X minus Y less than delta, then absolute value F of X minus F of Y is less than epsilon. All right, so here's the proof. Uh, since F is continuous at B for any epsilon greater than zero, then that means there's a delta th three greater than zero, such that for uh, the absolute value X minus B greater than zero, less than delta three, F of X minus F of B in absolute values can be made less than epsilon over two. Also choose delta one, delta two greater than zero, such that X minus Y less than delta one implies F of X minus f of y in absolute value less than epsilon over two, and x prime minus y prime in absolute value less than delta two implies absolute value f of x prime minus f of y prime less than epsilon over two for x, y in the closed uh, bounded, uh, sorry, in the closed interval from a to b, and x prime y, um, and x prime y prime uh, in the closed interval from B to C, as in, you know, the statements one and two, then choose delta to be the minimum of delta one, delta two, delta three, then for any uh, X minus Y in absolute value greater than zero, less than delta, the absolute value of F of X minus F of Y uh, is equal to this expression here, F of X, absolute value F of X minus F of B plus F of B minus F of Y. That's by the triangle inequality less than or equal to absolute value f of x minus f of b plus absolute value f of b minus f of y, which is less than epsilon over two plus epsilon over two, which is epsilon. So that shows that the lemma is true. And we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna use this lemma to prove theorem one in the appendix, which I'll read out here. And this is the last thing in the, in the appendix, uh, other than the exercise set. Um, this is the last of the part in the summary of the chapter. Uh, so theorem one says, if F is continuous on the, the closed interval from A to B, then F is uniformly continuous on the closed interval from A to B. And then uh, here I just, Spivak starts by making a, by um, starts the proof by making a, a definition, which I have written here. So let F be continuous on the interval from A to B, the closed interval from A to B. We call uh, F epsilon good if for epsilon greater than zero, there's delta greater than zero, such that for any y1, sorry, for any y comma c in the closed interval from a to b, uh, if y absolute value y minus z less than delta, then absolute value f of y minus f of z less than epsilon, uh, then we define 
the set A. Oh, I should say uh, before I um, go on here, uh, that definition is not a standard definition. Uh, I've never seen that term epsilon good before, but he uses it for the proof. So that's what he means when he says epsilon good. Um, in, in like analysis classes, this theorem is usually proved by making a compactness argument. Um, but here in this chapter, because chapter eight is on uh, the least upper bound property, he wants to prove this statement using the least upper bound property. So that's what we're doing. So define the set A to be uh, the set of all X, uh, such that X is uh, greater than or equal to A, less than or equal to B, and F is epsilon good on the closed interval from A to X. Then A is in, a, uh, little a is in A, which implies that A is not empty. And furthermore, B greater than or equal to X for all X in A implies A is bounded above. So there, so a, uh, the set A has a, um, greatest, uh, sorry, at least upper bound. So we'll call it alpha. Alpha is the supremum of A. Then alpha less than or e has to be less than or equal to B because it's the least upper bound and B is uh, upper bound. Um, assume that alpha is less than B, then we'll derive a contradiction. Then there's a delta one greater than zero such that for absolute value Y minus alpha less than delta one, absolute value F of Y minus F of alpha less than epsilon over two. Since f is continuous at alpha, uh, so if absolute value y minus alpha less than delta 1 and absolute value z minus alpha less than delta 1, then, <coughs> excuse me, absolute value um, f of y minus f of alpha less than epsilon over 2 and f of z minus f of alpha is less than epsilon over 2. Uh, and that implies that f of the absolute value of f of y minus f of z by the triangle inequality is less than or equal to absolute value of f of y minus f of alpha plus absolute value f of z minus f of alpha less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, which is epsilon, obviously. So that means that f is epsilon good on the uh, closed interval from alpha minus delta 1, uh, comma, alpha plus delta 1. That's by uh, the fact that alpha minus delta 1 is less than alpha because alpha is the least upper bound right and uh, it's uh it works at the upper end point too because f is continuous at that point um so by the previous lemma then we have that f is epsilon good on the interval from the closed interval from a to alpha plus delta one and this contradicts that alpha was an upper bound for a so that can't be so that means that alpha can't be strictly less than b so next, uh, we want to show that B is in the set A as well. So assume that alpha is equal to B, then that means that uh, then F is continuous at B implies for epsilon greater than zero. There's a delta two greater than zero such that absolute value Y minus B is less than delta two. That implies um, that F of absolute value F of Y minus F of B less than epsilon over two. So again, by the previous lemma, F is epsilon good on the closed interval from A to B. Therefore, that means that B is in the set A. Um, also, since epsilon was arbitrary, um, that means that F is epsilon good on the entire interval from A to B, the closed interval from A to B for every epsilon greater than zero. And that's the proof. So every so if you're working over a closed bounded interval uh, and F is continuous on that closed bounded interval, then, then you automatically know that F is uniformly continuous on that interval. And that's the last uh, last thing in the, the uh, appendix, my summary for the appendix to chapter eight. So let me stop the screen share. Um, and there's only four exercise problems for the appendix, but I still have to do those. Um, but hopefully I'll be able to post the solution set to, to those problems um, this weekend. If not, it'll probably happen sometime this week. And then finally, we can get around <laughs> to the Dedekind construction, the, the Dedekind cut construction of the real numbers. And oh, actually, no, I can't do that yet uh, because I have to do the intermediate chapters in Tau first. So I still have to do ta uh, Tau's chapter three and four. And then I wanted to do um, chapter five in Tau and the uh, Dedekind cut construction in Spivak together um, at the same time, just to compare and contrast the two methods of constructing the real numbers. So um, after I finish up the exercise set for chapter eight, actually, I'm going to switch over to Tau for a little bit and we'll do chapter three and chapter four. And then we can finally tie all the foundational stuff together and then we can get on to derivatives and integrals. So um, again, um, 
I'll see you guys in the next video. Do like and subscribe if you, you know, enjoy the content because it helps the channel grow. You know, all that usual YouTube stuff. <laughs> and, um, you know, let me know what you think down below. I'll see you guys in the next video.